And here we go. Which is great. Hello, everyone, popping in. Give everybody a few minutes here. And we are recording. Yes. Okay, great. So awesome. I see the number increasing, which is great. Um, give everybody a few more minutes and then we'll kind of get going. So for those that are popping in, just to kind of go cover a few things, we are recording this session. So if you um, miss anything, you want to refer to something, uh, you'll have the ability to do so. Uh, so I do just want to make that uh, people aware of that. I'm going to share my screen real quick, Erin. Sounds good. Okay. So before I get going, um, well, I'll kind of let people know who I am first. So uh, my name is Neil McKenzie. I'm the Director of Marketing here at, at Universal Furniture. And I'm joined by, uh, with uh, Aaron Bell Vensich. Did I do it? You did it. Awesome. Also known as Aaron V, which is much easier. Much <laughs> so, easier. Um, Aaron's going to kind of share with you a number of things, I think, to, uh, to assist you, certainly during this time, but I think just in general uh, in beefing up um, really some, some of the tools that her team has available to, I think, make the digital experiencing experience more meaningful to you on an ongoing basis. Uh, one of the things I wanted to share uh, before we turn it over to Aaron, just to kind of get started, is um, our virtual market experience has been live uh, since Wednesday. Uh, you can still sign up and get in. We have some exciting content in here, including information on our new Coastal Living collection called Getaway. We have some new introductions for Modern that you can actually take a 360 walkthrough of our showroom, uh, get a video download from our product development team uh, on Monday. We have uh, an overview on our new special order upholstery offering uh, that's going to be manufactured here in Conover, North Carolina. And then, as I mentioned, uh, this is going to be recorded and it is all going to be here on Monday inside the educational component of this virtual market site. So if you missed anything uh, today, if you wanted to go back and look at something, you'll have that ability to do so on Monday with links to those sessions here. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen, Aaron. There we go. And I am gonna kick it over to you. All right. Great, so, thank you. Aaron, you're welcome. Thank you very much for joining us and uh, I will let you uh, take it away. Okay, awesome. I will get my screen shared here and hit play. So hi everyone, thank you for joining. Super excited to be sharing these thoughts and ideas with you um, on service at scale, understanding the luxury millennial buyer and our, their digital first needs. Um, as Neil said, we'll be taking questions at the end and you can chat at any time. So I'm just gonna roll through this and um, we will make it available on Instagram Live and everywhere else later as well. So before we start talking about millennial shopping habits and the needs of our new luxury buyer, I think it's important to understand the evolution of where we've come from in the digital space over the last 20 years before we can really look at where we're going for the next year to the next 20 years. Uh, hopefully these insights will inspire the way you look at your own business evolution. And I think it's really important to recognize that that's what we're talking about here, really, you know, the back end, right? The messy stuff that slows us all down and figuring out how we can better our service offering. So let's look at the digital evolution, but first a little about me. So my evolution version 1.0, uh, prior to starting my design firm, I spent six years in media. This is going back 20 plus years. I started very young um, and worked with a range of brands from HGTV, um, AD, the Today Show, uh, we did a lot of media-based designs and media tours for Betty Crocker and eBay and all these different types of companies. So I like to say that it was really a, a very much kind of a digital design experience from the beginning for me. I graduated from high school early. I skipped college and went straight to work, garnering a professional resume in the lifestyle space with these brands and helped write two books on home decor and style with Simon & Schuster, an amazing publisher in New York, all before the age of 24. Then at 24, 
I started my own design firm. I left uh, my job with $3,000 in my pocket and was like, I'm going to be an interior designer. Um, I started the design firm Airbnb Design Group, which we've done for 16 years, have projects all over the country at all sizes. I mean, when I started, I started charging $25 an hour and it was a little condo project here in Toluca Lake in Los Angeles uh, and then developed properties. So um, I was the real estate developer on that house you see on the left. Uh, it's been in Architectural Digest, it's been in Cadillac commercials. Um, so I've done all ranges of the design side from hospitality to residential at all levels. Um, in 2011, I launched a furniture showroom for my line. We had a 5,000 square foot showroom on Robertson, did that for three years, and then very happily pivoted the Air &B brand into the trade only model. So Air &B furniture is made in LA and sold around the country. And now I am working on um, quite a few licensed collections with incredible brands that you can find at High Point Market. So more to come on that later in the year when we're all allowed to go back to market. And now version 3.0 of my evolution, three years in tech. Um, I was really frustrated by the broken process of the design firm. I felt after 13 years in business, there was so much paperwork, so many Excel spreadsheets, so many budgets and documents and keynotes and PowerPoints. And we were just, I felt like we were doing it wrong. Like something was wrong with our business because it was so hard to do business in the digital age. And then I started talking to more of my design friends and found they all pretty much had that same problem and those same complaints. None of the tech we used connects. Uh, we didn't have one place to work. We were all basically going to five or six different platforms or pieces of software every day for work. And if you think about it in those terms, you know, how inefficient to go to five offices every day, right? But that's just kind of what we're used to doing these days. We're in Pinterest, we're in Keynote, we're in Excel, we're in you know, Asana, we're in Basecamp, we're in QuickBooks, we're in Ivy, we're in Studio, we're on 100 websites finding product. It's crazy. Um, so I'm really going to share the insights that I've learned from spending the last three years building software for our industry. Um, everything from, you know, learning how to raise money from venture capital firms and what the tech industry's kind of core focus is and why tech has taken over our, our world. And now how can I build better software for all of us to streamline our process? Um, so I think it's more important than ever, obviously, right, to offer up incredible service, experience, and be able to do it from anywhere quickly and with a repeatable process. So keep in mind um, evolution of process as we go through this. And I'm happy to provide these, these slides to Neil and he can make them available to anyone if you'd like um, to have the, the PDF after this. So everyone likes to talk about how much money they're making, but how much money are you losing? I came across that quote about a year and a half ago, and it really hit me because to the average designer who maybe doesn't have a business background, that's most of us. I mean, I didn't go to college. I just started my company, right? And I think a lot of us are in that, um, in that same kind of boat. We get in it to be creative, not really thinking about the, the financial aspects as heavily as we should. And it's one thing to focus on your revenue, but then when you look at your process, how much money did you actually make on that job? You know, did you bill enough? time to spend? Um, at what point do you start losing money as a designer on a project when you're not building enough or because of mistakes or because you're spending 10 hours building on a budget when you should be spending 35 minutes? You know, I think um, more of us need to think about that and particularly in times like these where we need to really focus on being profitable but also just not wasting time time and losing money, um, your process is the only place that you're going to be able to make that change, right? And then also so keeping in mind that as designers, we are in sales. This also took me years to be able to like come to grasps with and, and be okay with being a salesperson. For years in the beginning of my design firm, I was like, I'm not a salesperson. I'm a creative. Like I don't sell. No, no, no. And I just had this like huge wall up about being in sales. And then I realized, oh my God, I'm always selling. Like I'm selling my ideas to a client. I'm literally convincing contractors why they should build it this way instead of that way. You know, my entire life is not just selling sofas and furniture, literally, but also just selling ideas and feelings and why people should change their home and why it's important. And um, so I think, you know, this quote from Tony Robbins, who I think is an awesome inspirational speaker and very wise is people buy feelings, not things. So as much as in our industry, we are literally selling sofas and chairs and tables and beds, we're really building in them a lifestyle, right? We're selling a feeling and not things. And I think as you look at how you offer up your business 
to sell that to your client. What about it are they buying from you? They don't just need you to access the discount to buy the chair, right? They want more than that. And I think leaning into that as you also promote yourself will make it much more easy to actually get more customers by selling that than just selling things. So focusing on our largest consumer audience, um, according to the Financial Times, millennials are the world's most powerful consumers. We know that to be true, we've seen it coming, but it's here. 2019 was the first year in US history that the number of millennials surpassed the number of baby boomers. Um, and by 2024, 50% of the luxury spend will be controlled by millennials. And when you look at that word luxury, it doesn't just mean Louis Vuitton and Gucci. I mean, really, most product at market technically falls into the luxury category. I think even an $800 dining set with tables and chairs technically is luxury, even though a lot of us might not consider that to be so. Um, so pretty much all of our customers, anyone hiring designer falls into this category. And in this high touch industry, savvy design firms are really evolving their process with the new demands of their digital first clients. Good design will always be in demand, but great service is becoming even more valued as the definition of luxury transforms from product focused to experience focused. And I think we've all heard about how millennials value experience over everything. And obviously now as our teams are you know, dispersed, um, how can we keep that expanding and the service growing? So the ways businesses can stay ahead of the competition and also stay relevant is to cater towards the millennial generation. And that starts with a better understanding of their expectations and behaviors, right? Um, what has driven our now generation here? So how do luxury brands and design companies grow with millennial consumers? By giving them digital freedom. Today's client expects service, connectivity, transparency, and personalization from their design professional like never before. Another great quote from Forbes, the luxury market has grown at staggering pace in recent years, yet luxury brands face serious challenges in the years ahead if they fail to engage millennial consumers on their own terms. And I think it's really important to remember as a designer, you're a luxury brand, right? We're all trying to create and brand ourselves, um, be different, be special, stand out. Uh, I did a podcast interview with Jenna Christensen and she is um, an incredible business coach and uh, inspirational speaker in her own right. And when we were, I was interviewing her last week, she just kept saying over and over and over again, um, as a designer to stand out, you need to be different. You need to lean into what makes you special and sell that. And as I look at the most successful designers around the country and around the world, you know, you can really start to see their work, right? And so her whole um, process that she takes companies through, which I think she's amazing. She does consultations. Check her out. Jenna Christensen, uh, GC Collaborative. She's really smart. Um, is to lean into your differences, right? And to, to show that to the world in your Instagram, in your Facebook, in your, on your website. Um, and the other side of that is understanding what your customer really wants, right? They don't want to wait. They don't want to call and they don't want to think very hard. Um, so this not only is relevant for the design professional's office and dealing with vendors, but your clients expect the same thing from you. They don't want it to be so hard to go through the design process. So the new mentality of younger designers and clients is generally they're frustrated by broken processes and lack of transparency and efficiency from the design office. That's, you know, not meant to sound negative and be mean, but it's true. I mean, I can say it from my own experience, like our process is brutal. It's slow. There's so many humans involved. You got the contractor, the architect, tons of vendors, like there's just so much manual data being shared and when I step back and think about email, I think about it like a game of leapfrog, you know, like the designer sends something to the client and then they send it back and they send it to the vendor and the vendor or the showroom, and the showroom sends it to the vendor. And we're all like playing this game of leapfrog with each other and copying and pasting out of emails and pasting it into other systems so that we have transparency in the office. And when you think about it from the client side, like put yourself in their shoes, how frustrating to wait days for answers, right? When in their pocket, they've got Google, this Oracle that can give them answers in seconds. So they're used to that in their daily life. And then they come into the design space and it's like being sucked back in time or like quicksand. So speeding up those answers and also setting those expectations up front with your client, I think is super, super important. Letting them understand that there's multiple humans involved and every answer you can't give them instantly because you have to wait for three other people. And so the best design firms really educate their clients up front about that process, um, which I think is really important, especially today. 
uh, the digital face of your brand should be the most important aspect of your business. In years past, it's been your website, right? Now it's your Instagram and your Facebook. I mean, most clients go to your Instagram first. So if you are selling design services, are you using the Instagram like that? If you're a new client, would you hire you based on your Instagram? Then if they really like you, they're going to go to your website. Um, by 2025, millennials will also be 75% of the design office. So if you're hiring a team, recognizing that your new employees, if not already, are going to be 75% millennial. That means they've grown up with a phone in their hand. They don't want to make 100 phone calls to get pricing. They don't want to spend hours and hours and hours doing repetitive manual data entry when with better software, they could do that faster. And then your whole team could take on more projects because you're not wasting so much time on administrative work. Um, millennial designers shop online first, no big surprise there. And currently we're all shopping online first, right? So we frequent brands that make it easiest. And I think as a designer, it's really important to um, let the brands that you love know if they have bad sales tools online or if they should really step up their website. Like I've always been the one to kind of um, openly suggest changes, no matter if I'm sitting at a restaurant or if I'm helping a friend in, in their business. And I think that the more we share with each other and we share with the companies and the salespeople that we love, like if it's hard to buy from them, just let them know, right? So that they can tell their boss or they can tell the owner of the company and they can work on their process as well. Cause we are all in this together and staying silent. If something isn't working for you or you need better sales tools from the brands you work with, like let them know, they really need to hear that, especially now. So that they can quickly evolve their process and service you better. Uh, Cause frankly, I mean, the average is about three seconds on a website. If it doesn't work, click, we leave, we go somewhere else, right? Um, so millennial designers frequent brands that make it easiest and they avoid making phone calls like the plague. So also knowing that your clients are going to be that way, right? We used to really focus on in person, um, and now we can't do that for obvious reasons. But even just thinking back to months prior, um, if your client is used to getting everything digitally like that, is that how you're used to selling design services? So most of us were doing in-person presentations, walking them through, lots of hand-holding, um, and they would call us and ask questions. Well, now they really just want transparency into their projects. So how can you put their project in a way, in a place where they can log in anytime and get access, right? And streamline the um, to make it easy. And um, so how did we get here? Let's talk about that. Why is our largest consumer audience so impatient, so curious for behind the scenes details, and also so open to sharing and valuing experience over everything? I think um, looking at Google and the last 20 years of their uh, evolution is really interesting. And I think it really talks to all of those points of why everyone is so used to getting answers immediately is because we all have that ability these days, right? Google was launched in 98 by two Stanford PhDs. Six years later, it went through an IPO and they're on track to reach one trillion in valuation just behind Apple. And I think what's more interesting and relevant than any of that is their growth. They're still having a 26% increase in revenue year over year, growing now faster than ever. So although we might say, oh, of course, Google's out there, it's huge. They're growing at huge speed. That means there's more and more and more and more people that are continuing to get online. And their mission statement is really nice. It's to organize the world's information and make it universally acceptable and useful. And I think as a design office, we really need to take that in as well. How are we organizing our information and making it universally accessible and useful, right? Transparency in our projects, not only among our team, but also to our clients. So why did Google become so powerful? Uh, I think it comes down to four things, and these are four things that you can use in your own business to really uh, revolutionize and evolve your process, is knowledge, access, understanding, and speed. Google wasn't the first, but they did it the best. People want instant answers and quick access to knowledge about brands, about services, about the process, about their quotes, about their orders, about their in uh, invoices. Um, they're used to getting a real complete view these days also thanks to the internet and in large part, thanks to Google making everything searchable, right? So that's transparency, reviews, social proof and options. Um, data is no longer shielded like it used to be. It's really open to everyone. And if you experience that in your entire life these days, coming into the design process, you just generally expect the same thing. So welcome to the information age. Sharing is power. 
internet and social media has allowed us to take a one-to-one -one and make that a one-to-many. And I think when you also think about it in those terms, that's why social media has become so strong, right? Instead of spending an hour or two on the phone with a friend, you can post in a few minutes and hit all of your friends. So communication is frankly just sharing. Uh, social media is sharing and tech has merely crafted vehicles for our lives to help humans share from one to one to one to many. Um, so how can you distill down 10 years of knowledge or 20 years of experience as a designer into a few minutes of understanding and share that with your clients and your future clients? How can you create tools that allow your teams to share on a broader stage, your work, your experience, what it's like working with you as a professional? Um, and how can you distill down massive amounts of information into bite-sized pieces that you can share easily with your clients, right? They come to you because you're gonna curate the experience of shopping at market. Universal has 1800 products. My gosh, that's a massive amount, right? So you go to your sales rep and you say, okay, here's what I need. What should I be looking at, right? We're all doing this process of kind of curating um, and clients don't want to be overwhelmed these days with too many options. So they come to you to curate that process and give them a better experience. I think this is a great article that everyone should read. It's by Mark Andreessen, Why Software is Eating the World. It was written in 2011 and it gets referenced constantly in tech. So as I was learning um, software world, you know, his name obviously keeps coming up. Uh, he's now a massive VC, incredibly successful, um, Angries and Horvitz, but it's just a great read. It was written in, or published in the Wall Street Journal years and years ago. So, you know, why is software eating the world? Why is it so popular? Why has it shifted the way we communicate? Why has it shifted the way we learn? Um, after all, our industry is all about communicating for commerce, right? That's what we do. Um, we share knowledge to sell products and we're constantly as designers educating our clients. I hear that time and time and time again from my design friends. It's, oh, got to educate your client, got to educate your client, got to educate your client. Obviously, right? Many of them have never interacted with our world until they hire us. And um, if we're constantly doing that same thing, shouldn't we build that into a repeatable process, right? Wouldn't your clients love to have an onboarding packet that explains the emotional journey? I have designers and friends that are super successful that have these phenomenal onboarding packets that they've created for just this reason. Help their client understand, provide them in an easy understanding way. Um, they've got a great little graphic that's like an emotional journey of the project from excited to horrified to finally having a party and loving your house at the end. I think it's genius. Um, I'm happy to share that as well. I'm sure my designer and friend in San Francisco would be more than happy to share that. Um, but, you know, message me if you want to see her kit. It's amazing. Uh, so reason number one that software and tech is kind of eating the world, if you will, is tech is help. The entire tech industry is about bringing service, helping someone, solving a pain point, adding value, creating impact. As I um, met other tech entrepreneurs throughout my journey the last few years, um, they all said the same thing. Hey, let me know if I can be helpful. Let me know if you need an introduction. Let me know if I can add value to your process somehow. These are people I'd just met. Um, and they weren't looking to sell me anything. I mean, I was frankly shocked. Like it was the first industry as a whole that had that as their main focus. They put that up front. And even though I was a stranger, newly introduced to most of them, they would really say those words and do it. And it was awesome. Um, and then they look at their business in the same way, right? And if you talk to any successful business person outside of design, and, and I'm sure many in design also think this is, as well, but we don't often talk about these things. Um, if you're constantly focusing on your customer experience, right, that gets better. I mean, Neil does a crushing job at Universal. It's amazing. And most brands don't do that. Um, and most designers, I don't think, focus on that either. I know I certainly didn't. So software can help you do, um, you know, more than just that one-to-one. -one. You can do one-to-many. That means you'll be able to take on more projects if your process is good. Um, a repeatable process to help people improve their lives is super, super powerful. And as a designer, I know that although the product I'm specifying for the project might be special and unique for each client um, because it's style, the look, whatever it is, the process is exactly the same. I'm doing the exact same work every single, process, every single project. Um, so figuring out how you can make that faster and smoother is super powerful and will dramatically impact your bottom line and allow your business to get out of this um, area that we all are in now and be much more powerful and long lasting. Uh, so fundamentally, technology has as its core, the complete focus on constantly improving the customer experience. So think about how can you improve your customer experience? 
Another great quote from Steve Jobs, innovation is the ability to see change as an opportunity, not a threat. Love that. Reason number two software is eating the world is tech is freedom. The internet offers access to knowledge. Self-education is topping $355 million a day online. That's people buying courses. Uh, we're gonna see a big shift towards that even more now, right? With schools are closed. Um, and a lot of universities at that level, they already offered online programs, but now that with the younger generations is a force of need. But I think um, also just the, um, the courses out there, the master classes. I mean, I know I've created a, a 32 part design course program that I'm about to launch. Um, I started this a year ago and it's now just going to be launching in the next few weeks. But as a designer, there's a lot of ways that you can earn money and sell your knowledge. It does not have to be the traditional route. So I think also the most successful firms are evolving their process, evolving their sales offering and figuring out, wow, if there's all these people online that would pay me a smaller amount, but the work is so tiny, right? I can create something that can just keep selling itself. That can be really, really po uh, powerful. So self-education is growing to $1 billion a day by 2025. Uh, I mean, that's, that's in a few minutes, you know, and that's the type of uh, money that's being spent online. And today's billionaires all have one thing in common. They invested heavily in their own ability to learn. So time is money, especially in a service business. So how can you make interacting with your brand a great experience and also make it happen faster so you can earn more money? Number three, tech is speed. Um, if you break it down, like the speed of particle flow alone equals power, right? The faster you can get something done, the better you can do, the more you power your business gains, the more power your life gains. You know, people that can do more in a faster process versus that do less in a slower process are just generally more successful. So figuring out how to cut the dull, boring, wasted time and hours of managing projects out of your process is just going to allow your business to gain so much more power. So holding on to slow process will not bode well for businesses in the next year or in the next 10 years, which I think is why everyone's here today. Um, and ultimately, uh, this is a great quote I came across from Peter Drucker, who's kind of the father of modern business. Um, business only has two functions, marketing and innovation. And at a high level, if you really think about that, it's so true, right? You need to be always evolving your process, evolving your offering, figuring out how you can become more profitable. How can you cut out wasted time that's just sucking the profit out of your projects? And marketing. Spread the word, spread the word, talk, share. How can you share more? How can you share better? How can you share one thing here and now share it over 10 different channels to reach more people without having to repeat 10 different bits of content? Um, some of the best marketers figure out how to use that same content in multiple different ways. And for designers, that's your projects, right? That's your beautiful pictures. Um, you look at Instagram and some of the smartest Instagrammers are constantly reposting the same beautiful images. You know, I, I thought, oh, once I posted it once on Instagram, like I could never post it again. Well, that's not true. Uh, if you look at some of the best feeds, they're taking those really gorgeous, sexy, powerful shots that they have that get the most likes and they're reposting them every few weeks and more people see it and they love it. And then you're not having to waste time creating unique content. If you've got content that works, just keep sharing it. So reason number four is tech is innovation. The phone book could have been Google, but they didn't innovate. And if you look at this old picture of the phone book, it's Google, right? It's a listing of people's contact information, which is probably number one reason why we get to Google something. Um, and advertising, right? It's companies being like, hey, find me, here I am. Um, so the phone book was offering up knowledge, access, and understanding, but they didn't uh, innovate, and they certainly didn't have that speed element, right? And that's why Google was able to wipe them out, and they're gone. Nobody uses the phone book anymore. So this is a really relevant quote for our industry. Only one in 10 that could hire a designer does. So there's nine other humans out there that could be hiring you and that could be using your services. I think that's a really exciting number because it just shows that there's plenty of customers out there and there still will be. And as we all get back to a case of normal life in coming months and years, um, our industry is just gonna continue to grow. There's nine other humans out there that could be using our services. So how do we market to them, right? And how do we reach them? Number six, uh, I cut a couple of these out, so it might not be number six, apologies. Tech is repeatable. Software helps you build a repeatable process. And if you look at any successful business, their process is very formulaic and they're constantly looking at how to evolve it and cut time out of it, right? So that they can do more 
in the same time or in less time. Um, so repeatable process is really important to focus on. This not only allows your customers more time, but it allows you to bring them value. They'll come back to companies that bring them value and make their lives easier. Um, for designers, um, referrals is our number one source of business, right? The majority of my customers have all been referred to me by a friend, by another client, um, by a personal introduction of some sort. And very few of them just see me in a magazine and call. That has happened, but that's not the majority. Most are referrals. And yet, by the end of a lot of our projects, clients are frustrated. They're like, oh, this was so painful. Um, we love our house, but the process of getting here was just really an emotional you know, wreck or the construction side, right? It's late, it's over budget. It's generally things out of the designer's control, but still like that's not where we want our customers to end up at the end of the journey, because that's when they need to be so thrilled with you and your services that they're referring you to their neighbor and all their friends that come over, right? Like, each client is a huge opportunity for referrals, but if they're frustrated and beaten down by the end of the process, they're not gonna be giving you those referrals. So also thinking about in the honeymoon stage of the project, at the beginning when they're excited about their new remodel and their new house or whatever they're doing, their new room, um, what can you be giving to them to share with their friends, right? At that moment when they are really excited about your work and your services and they could be telling all of their friends, I have this awesome designer. They've got a great process. It's super easy. Look at her work, check out her Instagram and we do it all online. It's so easy, right? Like those are the types of things we want our customers to be saying. So designers really need to focus on building repeatable processes so they can not only save more time, but that makes them more profitable and provide faster, more consistent service to their clients. And the right soft software can help that. There's a lot of things out there that you could use that will make an impact um, to update your business. If it's even just a project management tool like Asana, like Basecamp. I know a lot of designers use Basecamp, um, but still it's probably a very small piece of the overall puzzle. Um, so figure out what works best for your firm, but holding on to the way we've always done it, I, I think you'd probably agree with me by now, it's just not gonna cut it. So learning points from Google, how can you off organize your office's information and make it universally accessible and useful? How can you offer up faster answers with a repeatable process? How can you make the process of design easier to understand, easier to navigate for your clients and easier to interact with? You know, um, that upfront kit, setting expectations, providing them constant updated access to their project digitally so they can get in and know what their lead times are, understand what they even bought three months ago that hasn't been shipped yet. Um, I mean, put yourself in your client's position. There's a lot of foggy questions um, and we, they trust us, right? That's a big, piece of our industry is trust. They trust you with their money and their house and their, their family's most important asset. And if they've handed over, you know, five grand, 10 grand, a hundred grand to do a project and they have no idea when stuff's coming, what they even ordered because you took that project, you know, presentation with you, or you sent them a hundred invoices on email and through 20 different emails, they've got like different things and they don't know what's the most current one. I mean, this is frankly kind of the process we've been doing business with for a long time. And I think that's not a very good process. It doesn't feel good to your clients. So how can you put yourself in their shoes and reevaluate what you're doing? Um, and what have you done to frankly, just make your services more visible online? Because that is where all of our new customers are coming from. And how are you making it easier for your clients to buy through you than anywhere else, right? Wayfair's had almost a 30% increase in sales in the last two months due to the fact that suddenly everyone's home and they need office furniture, they need this, they need that. Um, so our industry, although that might feel like counterintuitive in many ways, businesses have not been able to ship or sell or designers projects have been put on hold, but not all. And globally, we're seeing a huge uptake. And if people aren't traveling, they're not spending money on vacations or clothes or other things that they'd normally do, entertaining, et cetera, they're gonna reinvest in their house. Um, so looking at the near future, I think my personal feeling is that we're going to re really see a big uptick um, for our industry, but it needs to be just as easy for a client to buy through you than to just go on a website and click order. Um, so that all comes down to new process. Um, so marketing basics, keep it simple, stupid, right? Information overload can be paralyzing. Millennials want quick responses, but they don't want to spend too much time sifting through tons of sources to find the right product or service to purchase. 90% of millennials research product reviews online before making a purchase. N yet there's probably very few actual um, reviews of designers and their services. 
Um, we don't really participate in Yelp that much, I feel like for the most, right? That's um, not really it anymore. So some of the smarter designers are putting um, clients, you know, um, quotes and um, testimonials is the word I was looking for on their own website. But are we using them on Instagram? If all of our clients are going to our Instagram first, are we putting those testimonials there? So that when that new client comes to your Instagram, they also get hit with that subtle sales message of, wow, XYZ design firm was so great to work for or work with, you know, they crushed my project. It was on time. It was on budget. It was gorgeous. My life is so much better. Probably not. Um, so that's something that came up in that call with Jenna Christensen last week, the podcast that I was to interview with her. Um, she said, most designers don't share on Instagram, and that could be Facebook as well, right? It's one and the same, basically. Um, like what it's like to work with them in their little comment section when they post. We're talking about how pretty the thing is or whatever. But if you reverse it and you come as a client and you're posting your beautiful project, most are not talking about like the real data about the project or what it was like to get that done or how the designer approaches problems, how we solve problems in projects. So that when you're that customer reading someone's Instagram feed, you suddenly have all this knowledge, understanding, you got it quickly. It was super easy about what it's like to work with you and your firm. And I was just like thrown back completely on my heels because I never thought about it that way either. And um, now I'm starting to see some designers that do that. I think it's so smart, right? But ultimately we all are on sa in sales. And if the digital face of our brand lives on Instagram, I think just by making some tweaks there that are totally free and easy to do, um, you can completely revolutionize your business and your sales tools. Okay, so ultimately wrapping up here, what does that mean for us? Streamline your offering and potentially evolve to a multi-tiered approach to sell your services and gain more customers. Always smart, diversify. Um, make it easy to understand quickly, have a great onboarding page on your website, have a packet you send them, start sharing that on Instagram and Facebook. Offer up all the knowledge digitally. Um, I think that can be kind of conceptualized as their project. Let them access their own project that they're paying for digitally. Provide value by saving your customers time and also um, become more profitable by saving your team time. There's a lot of great stats here on mobile habits. Um, and that's a whole area that I think we haven't even touched as design professionals, right? And many of our um, brands that we buy for <clears throat> haven't even started to touch that. But um, Facebook has 3.8 billion monthly active users on mobile and it's growing. It's crazy, growing by crazy, crazy numbers. So first thinking about your process in your office and then later, if you're, maybe you've evolved your process and you're feeling like you're rocking in that department, <clears throat> how is that experience on your client's mobile phone, right? When they get an email and they click in, can they see their project on, on their mobile device if they're looking at their project when they're in the car, in the office running? Um, I mean, think about it alone. Like we're all on our phone so often, yet the majority of our workflow tools are desktop based. And we just expect that that's where, how everyone is experiencing it on a laptop, but they're not. They're on their iPad, on the sofa at home at night. They're on their phone you know, while they're waiting in between a meeting and checking out stuff, hence Instagram being so popular, right? It's a beautiful, small scale visual way to get access to pretty things on their phone. Um, so I think just thinking about that experience as a business, as a designer, can your clients access all the things you're giving them easily on their phone? And that just makes it better experience, right? For them to work on their projects if they can. Um, Instagram is the new advertising platform. If you haven't thought about it yet, it's going to be even more so. We're all stuck at home. Instagram and mobile, you know, Facebook numbers are through the roof. All of our customers are there. They're like a captive audience. Now is the time to be taking advantage of that. Now is the time to be accessing the 1 billion monthly active users that are just sitting there looking for things, right? Um, more than 500 million people a day log into their Instagram accounts and it's free marketing. It's free advertising. And if you want to be smart and savvy, you can actually do paid and spend very, very little money reaching people that are looking for your types of services. 64% of users are between 18 and 34. So if your audience fits in that bracket, you kind of need to be on Instagram if you want to get noticed. Um, and 60% of users first heard about a product on Instagram. Now you might say, oh, well, most of my clients are older than that. Well, the other, you know, nearly 40% are over that age bracket, right? So they're still there too. And these young people that are growing up with this now, the young professionals in a few years are going to be buying houses. So getting on top of this now is just going to continue making your business 
more profitable in, uh, in the future. Mobile shopping habits are massively growing. 30% of users bought something they discovered on Instagram. I don't think any of us designers are selling on Instagram yet, right? But we certainly could be. I mean, why not? Put together a look, offer it up, they buy, you place the orders through Universal, through the brands that you shop at High Point and, and others. Like there's no reason all designers couldn't be having their own little digital storefronts. But most of us don't think about it that way because we're used to having one client at a time. We do this big, heavy, you know, paper heavy, long, laborious sales process. Um, but you see with platforms like The Perfect Room that Catherine Ireland has developed uh, with a lot of her kind of A-list celebrity designer friends, the Jeffrey Allen Marks, the Martin Lawrence Ballards of the world, they're selling up design packages. You know, she's got a design camp. There's a lot of these schools and kind of educational um, weekend experiences that designers are now using to sell their services. So there's just a lot of great ways these days to sell your knowledge and possibly make a lot more money in a very short amount of time than taking on a three-year project. Um, I would challenge most of you as well, if you could look at the profitability of your projects for the amount of years or months you spend for what you actually earned, minus all of your staff time and expenses, how profitable are the projects that you've done? Um, I know for me, I've lost money on a lot of them and I'm just not charging right. So we now do an hourly rate plus the markup. You know, we've really revolutionized the way we sell our services and we're not scared to just push back to a client and say, I'm sorry, that's not included. You have to pay me for my time. Like I have to pay myself and my whole team. We can't work for you for free. Um, and now we're looking again at ways to just sell our knowledge and services in other ways. So LinkedIn is a professional B2B gold mine. We are B2B businesses and um, it's the most used social platform among Fortune 500 companies. So if you're wondering where are all the successful business people that could be your clients, they're on LinkedIn. And most designers, I don't think even use LinkedIn as a way to put their information and put their businesses up there. It's a great way to access people and it's very underused in our community. Um, there's 2 billion millennials globally and 87 million of them are on LinkedIn. Um, so there's a, it's a great way to start looking at selling your services. So ultimately we've got a very solvable problem for our industry. It's just an evolution of process. Um, the long process costs more money and human time is the heaviest burden a business feels. So how can you set up your businesses to run smoother, run faster without such a huge administrative burden? I think it's better software and that's what we have been building. Um, so Style Row is a free service for designers. You can log up, log in today, sign up, um, get your free account. We have an incredible concierge service available if you need videos and how to's of how to use it. It's really, really easy. So I'm going to um, quickly overview some of our um, solutions and features that we've developed over the last year and a half and um, love your feedback. So please, the more you use it, the more we can build for you and the more we can continue to help build something that supports our industry. Uh, so number one, we've got our product library. It's a digital library for your firm. So as you go into showrooms or travel or take pictures, which we've all done many, many times, I have so many Dropbox folders of all my high point photos by month and by market. But the problem is my team can't easily access those pictures. So I go and I spend a lot of time and money to go to a trade show and take pictures. Yet I don't have a great place to put those for my entire design team to know what I love, to know what the vendor was, to know where I saw it and or what it was about the thing in that picture that I liked. So our digital library allows you to do that. You can clip, you can upload products of your own um, and then your whole team can filter and sort. It's really amazing. We also have a marketplace collection where we're pushing the high-end luxury products straight into your um, library. So you can quickly just heart and share a product with a client. We've got an inspiration board section. That's a Pinterest replacement. Most of us are using Pinterest, but Pinterest was not built to track feedback. It was not built to share with clients. I'm sure many of you have done digital Pinterest sharings with clients and their view loads differently than your view. So you're like, no, not that picture, it's a countdown three. Uh, again, it's a bad experience. And so why are we using this tool that wasn't really built for our business, right? Um, so our inspiration boards allow you to put all of the kitchens, dining rooms, living rooms, whatever it is you want to save um, right in there. And our concierge will help pull those all in for you. Um, our clipper. So as you're shopping online, you can go to universal.com, open up the clipper. It's an extension for your Chrome browser. So really easy download. And in seconds, you can pull that product into your projects and share it in our digital dashboard with your client. 
So if you think about how much time we normally spend shopping and looking, I'm often logging into the same websites over and over and over and over and over again. Um, I think most designers do that, right? We love to discover new products, but at the same time we know the vendors we like, we go there first and we scroll through their whole catalog over and over and over. That is a, such a waste of time. Pull all your favorite products into your digital library. Then when you need to shop for side tables, poof, one click of the filter, there's all the side tables you already love. You already spent the time to find these things. So don't waste, you know, those moments again and spend another 10 or 15 minutes scrolling and scrolling and scrolling when you could have that all at your fingertips. So the Clipper is a really valuable, powerful tool. Other platforms have it. Ivy has something similar. Some others do as well. Um, it's a really good tool, but we have one and it really helps get your products into your projects quickly. Uh, our project management software is very unique. It's very visual based. We're visual people. That's why we get into this business. We don't want to look at Excel spreadsheets all day long, nor do the young designers coming into our offices. They don't want to work like that. They don't get into this business to be Excel spreadsheet wizards. Yet 80% of designers spend most of their time in Excel for their project management. And it was not built for that people. It's a terrible place to manage your project. Um, so this allows you to set a team status, set a client status. It automatically updates the date every time you change the status. So your team now can log in and everyone can see exactly where everything is without having to ask each other and email each other and dig through data. It's just right there. Um, you can drag and drop, you can reorganize, you can hide all the words if you just wanna look at the pretty pictures. And most importantly, you can Google your project, basically. We have a huge, powerful filter. You can say, show me all the lighting, show me all the side tables from Universal, show me what I clipped, show me what has a team status of approved or a client status of approved. Instant answers to your project. You don't have to go back through emails and emails and look and look and ask 20 people. It's all right there. You can export to Excel, you can export to PowerPoint, and we have connected digital dashboard for your clients and a budget. So um, you can collaborate with your team. There's notifications, it emails everyone. We've basically been rolling in all the workflow into one software solution so we can save the industry time. Because if designers can do more projects in less time, they're gonna be able to buy more product. That supports the brands that we know and love. That supports our sales teams and all the vendors that we buy from if we are more productive, right? So I think as an industry, um, and that's why I've built tools for designers first is because if we can, if I can help save everybody time, if I can help save my own design firm time, we're going to take on more jobs. That means we're selling more product and it's a win-win for the whole industry. So um, this is our digital dashboard. Your client basically can get a simple little link that you send to them. It's got your design firm logo in it. And now they can interact with their project from anywhere, anytime. They can approve items for purchase if you choose to share pricing. They can like, dislike, and they can comment and chat with you. So um, like many owners of design firms, you might have this issue. Your clients text you, but yet you need to share all that information with your team. And so I'm now going through my emails, my text messages, wondering where my client left that note. Well, if we give them one place to communicate with us, that all syncs instantly with your project view and your whole team can see what the client said. They can see what the client liked. They can see what the client didn't like. You don't have to be stuck in the middle simply being that leapfrog to regurgitate information back and forth and back and forth. And that means a faster process. Hey, Aaron, two, uh, two questions that have come through. Uh, one, can you import uh, pictures from Pinterest or really, I guess, anywhere else? Yes. Into, you can. Okay, great. So you can and use then, the clipper and go clip your own Pinterest images, or um, you can let our concierge do it for you. It's way faster. I highly suggest you do that. Um, but you can also upload images. So any photography, any images, PDF, invoice, quote, document, whatever you have, you can upload it into your library and your projects. And then another question right now is this, do you have the ability to uh, purchase products through the tool? Not currently. Um, so we've started building uh, inspiration, Pinterest replacement, um, the budgets, Excel replacement, project management tools, client communication and team communication. We will be layering in that vendor communication in the next many months. That's on our roadmap, as we say. Um, you can think about building software very much like building a house. You got to put in the foundation first, then you put up the walls, and then you put on the roof. So we're constantly building software. I have a team of 15 full-time software engineers and a team of 10 here in Los Angeles. So we're about a 25, 26 person company. 
Um, and this is all we're doing. So now we've, we're launching our marketplace um, with bespoke boutique made to order products. And then we will be continuing to go down market and bring on um, in stock, ready made, you know, all the different price points so that designers can really use Style Row as a complete one stop shop and collaborate with the vendors that you want to collaborate with. Because um, as a designer, I know I can't just, you know, I don't want to just work in a system where I can only select from certain products. The software is very flexible so that you can put in your vintage stuff, what your client already has, anything from any vendor. Um, you could use the dashboard, which I'm showing now, to share with a vendor. You know, you could put in things like, I'm looking for something like this kitchen. Do you guys have any lights like those black ones? And you could share that with a vendor and collaborate through the tool. Um, you and could also share it with an architect this way. Aaron, when you're sharing this, whether it be to a vendor or to a client, do they need, to, I assume they just get a link and do they need to log in is really the question. They don't have to log in. They just get a link. They click it and the welcome screen. Um, if you go to Style Row, there are some many micro videos as well. Um, yeah. But again, our team can walk them, walk any designer through that wants a demo, but you can just get in and use it yourself. It's super easy. There's a sample project built into every new account. So you can play with that sample project and, um, you click that button right at the top there that says share with client and anything that you've made available in your project. Again, you have to specifically say to the system, I want to share this item, but not this item. I want to show pricing or I don't. So the designer can retains complete control. And then your client gets a link, they click it, um, they put in their name so that you know who's leaving you notes and they get into the project like this and then they can chat, like, dislike, etc. We're now building in the ability to share documents, tear sheets, invoices, quotes, PDFs, drawings, whatever you want to share with the person on the receiving end of that link, which could be your client, could be your architect, your builder, a vendor, um, they'll be able to download those documents and um, continue working. So a really great way to um, collaborate on project documents. Very cool. Yeah. Um, and Style Row is a free platform. That's one of the questions that came through. Yes, you can access yeah. uh, that. And I think Aaron, as men Aaron, Aaron has mentioned, the website that she has uh, that's up and running, there's tons of supporting materials in terms of getting really a full on rundown and or scheduling a demo, uh, yes. a one on one demo for, for your business. Uh, it's a, I mean, I think fantastic tool. I think so simple, so intuitive um, mm -hmm. and the ability to kind of have everything in one place and, and share and, uh, and just, again, you know, I think save some time and, and, and do so kind of on the go. I think that's a, very important. Uh, one yeah. question came about, Aaron. Are you mm -hmm. comfortable sharing your percentage and or hourly fee? Sure. Um, I charge around $250 an hour for my time personally as a designer. Uh, I give myself a raise every year that goes up. So it might be $270 now. Um, and then my team, depending on who's doing the work, we charge for like a senior design 150, then I think we have like a 110 rate, a 90 and a 60 for like drafting time. Um, and so we tell our clients that the overall estimate that we're doing, uh, we guesstimate how much time and hours it will take to do a project. So maybe we say uh, it's gonna be 30,000 estimated fees and it's gonna be a blended rate of all of our time. So I bill my time at my hourly rate of 250 and then all the other people in the team, you know, build their hours accordingly. Um, and then that's worked pretty well. We generally take also about a, a third of that as an advance. So we take a big chunk up front and kind of work off of it. And then we build monthly for the rest. And then we charge generally a 30% mark markup on product. Um, and I think that's, it's a really important thing to explain to your clients. Don't call it a markup. Explain to them that you are buying at wholesale and you are retailing that product to them, they would never go into the department store and ask for their cost to make the shirt, right? Like it's all in the way you present that and explain to them all the time that it takes to order product, right? And we don't bill them for that time. So the, the um, purchasing fee is what we call it. Uh, some designers call it a commission. Um, it generally for us at least takes care of the hours to put the invoices together, do the follow-up, to do all the tracking, and handle all the returns, just like a contractor, right? Your contractor is gonna, if he's buying materials for you, for your project, he's usually at least putting a 10% margin on those or markup on that product. And he then checks the orders, makes the returns, handles any damages for that fee. And I think it's really important that designers explain that to their client up front. 
when a client comes to me and says, well, do I, what's my designer discount? I'm like, whoa, we need to really shift your thinking. It is not your discount. That's how I stay in business, you right. know, and explain to them the amount of hours and, and ridiculous amounts of time it takes to manage projects, but that's just part of it. Um, Jim Magney shared with me at one of our lunches we did for Style Road and Lunch with Thought Leaders. He's an incredible designer, um, very, very, very successful, huge projects, huge clients, right? What all of us would want to be able to achieve. Um, and he said, I tell my clients how much value, and you'll you remember that word from our presentation, right? All throughout tech, it's all about value, value, value. I tell my clients how much value I bring to their project. I make them money on their real estate. He's like, I straight up tell them, and he doesn't speak as kind of ghetto as I'm speaking right now. Jim's incredibly elegant, but he says, I will make you millions of dollars. So the million dollars that maybe you're spending on your designer, whatever that fee is, right? Um, your project is going to be worth so much more um, because he does you know, huge scale projects. But I know that from our own work, like I have many cases that I can look at and from a real estate value standpoint, um, I know I make my clients money. I know it, I've seen it. And I never share that with them though up front and I really should. And now since hearing that Jim does that, I'm like, oh my God, that's so obvious. Um, a project in Manhattan Beach, you know, the client spent a million dollars on the remodel that we manage and they sold the house two years later for a $2 million profit. That was purely on our work, right? We designed it, remodeled it. And that's the value that we bring to our clients. And now I think, again, having that confidence as a designer up front to tell your clients that, to expect that, they're not gonna nickel and dime you over your hourly rates and over your markup anymore when you really give them that knowledge up front of what to expect and be able to point to if you have some successful um, sales that you've been able to track of a how she worked on and the client sold it for more later after you did the renovation or the design. I think it's a great thing to share. Absolutely. Hey, yeah. we're, um, we're up against it here on our, on our time. I know oh. um, there were some few th more things that, but I think in terms of the style row overview, I would definitely recommend uh, going to the website and certainly reach out to the team members there and they'd be happy to, um, you know, set up a time to go over anything. Yeah. Um, we have recorded all of this and will make available by Monday on our virtual market website. Underneath this event, uh, you'll see a link to download. There were lots of questions as it relates to um, the, um, uh, the little onboarding kit. We'll put a link, I think, with that. Uh, a lot of Great. people requested that, so we'll make that available for people as well. And um, yeah, thank you all for spending some time with us. Aaron, this has been fantastic. I think a ton of t a ton of great stuff for people to really think through. Thank um, you. Even without us all being stuck at home, I think <laughs> the ability to think about, again, your digital uh, footprint and that ecosystem and what's that gonna look like for the variety of clients that you all uh, work with, uh, there is, I think, opportunities to take uh, you know, advantage of, of tools and, and certainly technology to uh, you know, improve your processes. So this was great. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you, Neil. And um, we also have, done quite a few webinars of walkthroughs of the platform and demos. So my team, if you email them, they can share you the link as well. Um, if you email customer service or on stylero.com, there's a little help button. Um, they'll send you the link to all those videos so you can watch those. Awesome. Cool. Well, thank you again. Um, and you. again, this will be on our website and we have some more stuff on Monday for you. So again, universalfurniture.com slash virtual market. And uh, yeah, thank you everyone for your time. All right. Thanks, Aaron. Awesome. Thanks, Neil. Right. You're the best. Bye, Bye. everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.